Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. to the viewers. I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, DAV PG College. And today I will be discussing on the topic migration. This is my 10th lecture. To begin with, what is migration? Migration is a phenomena which has been existence since time immemorial. We can't trace the time from when migration has been started. People used to migrate both within the national borders as well as outside the boundaries of a nation in search of better livelihood. Wherever you, they used to get a better livelihood or more better living condition, they used to migrate to that particular place. As far as this migration was voluntary in nature, people when used to move from one place to another willingly, there was no problem. But when the resources started getting scarce, and the movement of the people became forceful, then it started becoming a problem. So, when it was voluntary and there was no scarcity of resources, migration was not a problem. But when the element of force started predominating migration and the resources were scarce, it became a matter of serious concern. Basically, migration occurs because of two main factors. First is the push factor and the other is the pull factor. Now, what is push factor? When we push someone against their will, that falls into the category of push factor. So, migration caused by issues that would make one want to leave one place of resi residence such as the causes can be numerous, hunger, war, inappropriate living condition, they all can lead to individual move from one place to another, but that movement is not done voluntarily. They are forced to do that involuntarily because at one place nobody wants to leave their place of habitual residence until and unless they get some better opportunity at some other place or the living condition at that particular place is not appropriate for living. Next is the pull factor. Migration caused by elements that would attract one to a foreign state or some other region. Maybe that particular place, that particular region is offering better opportunity that can be employment opportunity, better living condition, better safety. When these push and pull factors are weighted up by a particular individual and occur together with available opportunity or a means to move, it will result into people movement moving from one state to another. It can be temporary in nature or it can be permanent in nature. 
coming to the categories of migration. Migration can be split into two main categories, voluntary and forced. Voluntary migration or the pull factor, what I was talking about, categorizes that those who could have stayed albeit sometimes with difficulty, but decided to move abroad. It is voluntarily in nature, people are willing, they want, but nobody is forcing them. It, they are doing so because they want to do so. The external condition is not pushing them. So, that can be categorized as voluntary migration. People are doing that voluntarily. Next is the forced migration. This forced migration is what we will be basically focusing on in this lecture. So, forced migration is a very contested category because it involves movement of people displaced by war, conflict or operation. So, it is basically compromising, people are compromising and it has a significant push factor. People are not willing, but they have no other option. They have no alternative. So, when they do not have any other option, they have no alternative. So, they are forced to change their place of habitual residence. That can be temporary also and that can be permanent also. So, the key elements that are involved in the forced migration. First, of course, force is involved. People are getting forced. They are pushed. Then there is of course, the lack of willingness. They do not want to leave their home. They do not want to leave their habitual place of residence. They do not want to leave their community. But as the condition is not habitable, they are forced to do that. The reason for this unwillingness can be multifaceted. They do not have enough money to move from one place to another, to restart their life at some other place. So, the most important is the lack of capacity to decide to leave their homes. It is not easy to again start your life, make your home, get relocated at some other place. So, the lack of capacity is one very important factor of this unwillingness or lack of willingness and for that particular reason, the force is involved. But their choices are restricted and limited because this population is facing the risk of their life. Their life is at risk. And what is the first thing that any individual want? That is life. When the person will be alive, then only he will have his basic necessity. So, life is important and to save that life, that person is forced to move to some other place. So, when that person calculates that what are the benefit of being at that place or leaving that place. And of course, when the issue of life come in between, so they are forced to 
change their place of residence. International Organization for Migration. It is one of the important organ of United Nation that is dedicated for migrants. It defines forced migration as a migratory movement which although the drivers can be diverse, but it involves force, compulsion and coercion. People are forced to do that, it is their compulsion and they are coerced. So, that movement, that migra migratory movement can be defined as a forced migration. The former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan report in 1992 describes forced migration as when the number of people that have been forced to leave their homes as a result of armed conflict, internal strife and systemic violation of human rights that can be described as forced migration. So, what are the factors that are causing forced migration? One is war and armed conflict that is the primary reason that are pushing people to resort to forced migration. The situation of conflict, war. So, number one reason is the war and armed conflict and it is because of this war and armed conflict that the right of the people is at stake. And when the life of the people are at stake, they have no other option but to leave their place. Then apart from wars, the next is the natural disasters such as flood, earthquake, storms, cyclones, desertification and drought. And the third one is the development, development project such as construction of dams, roads, urban renewal schemes, mines, land exploitation, resettlement and slum demolition. Now we have to look into the fact that war and armed conflict can lead to permanent forced migration, people permanently leave their homes because the condition at their homes is not habitable. In case of natural disaster, the migration is temporary, not permanent in nature because when the condition will be appropriate, when there will be, when the effect of this natural disaster will be gone, then they can come back to their place. The reconstruction work can be done by the government or any other international agency. And in terms of development project, people may be forced to leave their place of residence, but in most of the cases they get compensation for doing so. So, here the government is in most of the cases is not against them, but in this case when the situation of conflict is there it can be result of both war from above and war from below. So, a state can get involved in that and non-state can also get involved in that. 
So, this problem is more serious as compared to these two. Now, the post war po post cold war situation, the end of the cold war brought a lot of change in the world politics and as the world witnessed this change, the effect of that change was filled by each and every individual. So, the end of the cold war brought a change in the nature and intensity of conflict. Conflict used to take place before the cold war also, during the time of cold war also and after the end of the cold war also. But its nature changed since the end of the cold war and with the change in this nature, there has been proliferation of new wave of displacement, new kind of displacement proliferated. So, the period before the cold war was characterized by interstate war that means, one state was fighting with the another state, it was between states during the time of the cold war, before the cold war, the war were between two states, the first world war, the second world war were between the states, but the end of the cold war brought one major change and that was the intra-state war, which is also known as internal conflict. So, now with the end of the cold war, the conflicts were basically occurring within the states and these conflicts were characterized by different terms such as conflict based on identities, religious conflicts, ethnic conflicts and so on and so forth. And as these conflicts become widespread, the quantum of forced migration increased tremendously. There was a tremendous change in the nature of migration because of the internal conflict. So, the, the quantity of migration increased tremendously in the post cold war period and that was the reason that forced migration became a cause of major concern not only for the states, but for the international organizations too. So, when forced migration started affecting the lives of millions of people, it became the issue of serious concern because this forced migration was becoming an impediment for the development of many countries. They were acting as a roadblock for the development because the forced migration was posing threat to life, safety, health and many other things. And slowly and steadily, it took the shape of transnational problem that led to the conflict of interest among the communities. So, being forced to leave one's place of residence is a clear violation of human rights and their civil, political, economic and social rights. We have already discussed the concept of human rights in the previous lecture. So, nobody should be forced to leave one place of residence. It is a clearer violation of human rights. So, we can also so say that with the end of the cold war, the intensity of the violation of human rights 
also increased and it was causing tremendous human suffering. In fact, data says that one in every hundred women, children and men across the globe is displaced and the result and the cause behind their displacement is armed conflict, violence, ethnic and religious intolerance, prosecution and human rights violation. And this, this problem, this issue is a clear indication of the fact that government is failing to perform its duties. Because if one in every hundred men, women and children across the globe is displaced, what can we say if not that it is the failure of the authorities to comply with international humanitarian law. Lot of discussion has been done on international human rights, humanitarian law. But if people are still forced to migrate, then what is the use of those laws? Now coming to the impact of migration, what is the impact of migration? So the effect and impact of forced migration can vary. And it varies depending upon the context and various other factors. What can be the context? The political, social, economic, cultural, environmental context as well as gender, class, age, race, religion, ethnicity. All these factors have played an important role in determining the impact of forced migration. If any political factor is causing forced migration, that is having a different impact. If any social factor is causing forced migration, that can have different impact. In the same way, economic factor, cultural factor, environmental factor and the impact of forced migration varies according to the gender, class, age, race, religion and ethnicity. Forced migration and its impact on poor and rich differs. The extremely poor section of the society, especially women, children, they are at more disadvantageous position, F physically disabled, old age people, they all suffer more as compared to youth or men or the rich section of the population. So we also have to take these factors into account when we talk about forced migration. Now coming to the types of forced migration, what are the various types? So one is the refugees, next is the internally displaced persons, internally that means they are within the border of their country. Then asylum seekers, environmental and disaster displaces development displaces, smuggled people, trafficked people, etc. These are the types of forced migration. But among these types, the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration takes the movement of refugees and IDPs that is internally displaced person as the only variants of forced migration. 
Now focusing first on refuses. How do, do we define refuses? So according to 1951 United Nations Convention related to the ref, status of refugees and its 1967 instrument. A refugee is someone who owing to well founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or uh, political opinion is outside the country of his nationality and is unable to or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country or who not having a nationality and being outside the country of his former habitual residence as a result of such events is unable or owing to that fear is unwilling to return to it. Now, what are the things that we have to take into account when we talk about refugees? First is fear of being prosecuted and what are the reasons of this fear? It is their maybe their race, their religion, their nationality, it is because they belong to a particular social group or they held a particular opinion and because of that fear, they do not want the protection of their own country of which they are the citizens and they do not want to return to their own country. They are termed as refugees. So, the definition that is given by the refugee convention got further expansion with the convention governing the specific aspects of refugees problem in Africa and Cartagena declaration. So, according to ICRC International Committee of Red Cross, these declaration widely agree to definition that those people who make one's escape from events categorized by armed conflict, disrupted public order and other situation of violence, they can be termed as refugees. There is one definition given by Michael Dummett. He has contributed significantly in the field of study of refugees. So, Dummett says that while the principle embodied in the 1951 convention that is the refugee convention are manifestly correct, but nonetheless the qualification laid down by the convention are being entitled to claim asylum is too restrictive and for that reason Dermot offers a more broader view of refugees. So, he gives a more broad definition of refugees. So, he defines refugees as one where all conditions that deny someone the ability to live where he is in minimal conditions for a decent human life ought to be the grounds for claiming refuge elsewhere. So, all the conditions whether it is war like situation or they are facing terrorism from above or from below that is state sponsored terrorism or non state sponsored terrorism. So, all those condition that deny the ability 
to live where that person is living or had been living in a decent way if that condition is denied that can be a ground for claiming refuse in some other country because refugees are those who cross the borders of their countries so the intensity of the problem should be to the extent that it is not possible for the people to remain in their country of origin and this intensity of the problem forces them to cross the border of their nation because the situation is so perilous that there is always a fear and that fear is the fear of being persecuted because they belong to a particular religion or race or culture or nationality or some social group and they have different opinion that is in most of the times political in nature then the popular government and there is always the fear of violence because they have some different opinion that is not similar with the opinion of the government and this is creating massive human rights violation so in that particular situation that particular group or people belonging to that group cross the border of their country with the hope to seek assistance and protection in some other country or by the government of some other country or some aid organization so they are hopeful of the fact that their right to life will be secured when they will cross the border of their nation because they have no hope that the government of their the country of which they are the citizen will protect them so they are facing the state sponsored violence the state is a part of the violence and they have no faith on the instrument of the state although it is claimed that a state is the instrument that actually provides protection to us that has the responsibility to secure our life but in this case in the case of refugees it is the state that is the party to the conflict to the violence and that is party that is posing threat to the life of these individuals so in order to save and secure their life they want to cross the borders of their countries now what are the provisions as per refugee convention so refugees are having they are fortunate enough that they are having a separate dedicated legal instrument for their protection which is known as the refugee convention although they are very unfortunate people but in the further slides when we, i will discuss about the internally displaced persons we can infer that in comparison to internally displaced persons refugees are in a better position that's why i use it on fortunate ones so refugee convention is there for the protection of refugees but the problem is that this convention does not establish any obligation for the states to admit refugees into their territories 
and to grant refugee status to all those who are claiming for that status. So, it is a big problem because it is non-obligatory in nature. It, it can't force the government of other country to accept those people. So, as per article 33 1 of the refugee convention, the only obligation set forth in this convention is the principle of non refuelment. What is this principle of non refuelment? That is the prohibition against expelling or returning a refugee in any manner whatsoever to the frontiers of territories where his life or freedom would be threatened on account of his race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. So, this non-refoulement is a big rescue for the refugees that they can't be forced to return to their place of origin. But the states are not obliged to give them refugee status. So, before they get refugee status, they all are given the status of asylum seekers. So, you can define asylum seeker as the one who claims to be a refugee, but who claim, but whose claim has not been evaluated. So, they are in a midway. They want to be designated as refugees, but they have yet not granted that status. So, in order to give refugee status to asylum seekers, it is essential to determine their status through the process of refugee status determination RSD. Now, what is refugee status determination? Refugee status determination or RSD is a legal process that government or for that matter UNHCR used to determine whether a person seeking international protection is considered a refugee under international, national or regional law. So, the primary responsibility for claiming the refugee status lies with states. So, refugee status determination is a determining factor in deciding whether a person should be called refugee or asylum seeker because as I already told you asylum seeker is a step before becoming refugee or whether the person should be granted complete international protection or subsidiary international protection. So, the process of refugee status determination can be lengthy, tangled and is certainly not free from flaws because there is still no single uniting model for refugee status determination. So, refugee convention provides protection to the displaced persons who are recognized as refugees by the refugee status determination. So, after the process of refugee status determination, a person can get protection under refugee convention if he or she has been granted the status of refugee. So, after recognition by the refugee status determination, the refugees, the international community get authorized to take action in third countries for the persons who were subjected to persecution in their own countries. So, the protection mechanism that has been formulated by the United Nations for the protection of the refugees 
does not encompass the persons in flight or at risk within their own countries. So, when the conflict occurs in a particular country and it, it is posing threat to the life of some particular communities on the basis of their race, maybe ethnicity or religion or their political opinion whatsoever. If they have not crossed the border or if they have crossed the border, but they have not got the status of refugees, the refugee convention do not provide protection to these groups. Until and unless a person get recognized by the receiving country that yes, they are refugees, then only they can get protection under refugee convention. Now, the other group that is internally displaced persons, who are internally displaced persons? Internally displaced persons or they are also called IDPs are those persons or group of persons who have been forced or obliged to flee or leave their homes or places of habitual residence in particular as a result of or in order to avoid the effect of armed conflict, situation of generalized violence, violation of human rights or natural or human made disasters. But the point that we have to emphasize on in the case of internally displaced persons is that those persons who have not crossed an internationally recognized state border. So, they are within the border of their country where the persecution is taking place. They are facing the heat of the movement. They are facing the actions of their government. They are facing the state sponsored terrorism and they are forced to live with particular community or group or country or government that is against their life. So, their situation is more vulnerable than refugees. So, there are two important components of the definition of internally displaced persons. First, force or involuntary movement. Now, this factor is similar to the factor that is causing the refugees to flee, but one factor differentiate them from refugees and that is they are within the national borders. In case of refugees, refugees cross the borders of their country, they flee from their country, then they become asylum seeker and after that they can gain the status of refugees. But in case of internally displaced persons, this provision does not apply because they have not crossed the border of their country of which they are the citizens. So, refugee convention is there for the protection of refugees. So, you can question that what is the mechanism for the protection of internally displaced persons. So, the need for international standard for the protection of internally displaced persons become apparent, become essential in 1990s. Because the end of the cold war brought one major remarkable change and that change was that IDPs outnumbered refugees. 
So, the cause of refugees and IDPs are the same that is armed conflict, ethnic strife, human right violation and so on and so forth. But the protection mechanism for IDPs is not at par with refugees. So, IDPs should also get protection, they are also human beings, they also have certain inalienable rights. So, the first because the IDPs were outnumbering refugees, the first global IDP estimate that compiled in 1982 comprised only 1.2 million people. But by 1995, there were 20 to 25 million IDPs in more than 40 countries. Before the end of the uh, Cold War, they were restricted to only 11 countries. And they were twice the number of refugees. So, they require more protection mechanism because their number is not negligible they were outnumbering refugees. And what was the main reason for the growth of internal displacement? The main reason for the outgrowth of internal displacement is the increase in armed conflict and natural disasters. Now, we do not have control over the natural disasters, but we have control over the armed conflict because they are man made dis disasters, they are made by us. And this indicate the fact that national or the provisional government bears the primary responsibility to protect the victims, to protect the IDPs. So, the international community's role with respect to the protection of IDPs is complementary to the mechanism of the national government. But the irony of the situation is that more often than not, it is the government that are held responsible for protection of IDPs are themselves the part of the conflict which put their whole protection mechanism into question. So, those who are causing, causing the conflict, those who are making the situation worse, those who are the force behind their movement, they are the only ones who are responsible for their protection. So, it is an ironical situation. Now, in this situation, what can be the role of the international organizations? First, the issue of sovereignty is there that restricts international organizations to interfere in the internal affairs of the state. So, this issue of sovereignty provide a kind of protection mechanism to the governments who are posing threat to the life of these individuals. So, this issue of sovereignty is one of the very important factor that limits the role of international organizations. So, as a result of that, the responses by the international organization often prove to be inadequate in Congress and expedient. So, United Nations General Assembly in its report of the Secretary General on the work of the organization in 1991 tried to deal with this issue because it was an issue of grave concern. So, it affirmed that sovereignty of the state is inviolable, but it can be infringed depending on the situation. So, when the sovereignty of the state 
and the human rights of the individual are there. The human rights should precede over the concept of this sovereignty because we should not and there is no need to protect the sovereignty of the state by compromising with the human rights of its citizens. So, if the human rights of the people are getting violated and the state is unable to safeguard it or the state itself is a party to the conflict, the international community can intervene in that situation. And in that case, the states can't put their restriction on this act on the name of the sovereignty. They can't claim that their sovereignty is getting breached because it is the human rights of the individual that is more important than the sovereignty of the state. A state is there for the convenience of human beings. So, human beings and their lives can't get sacrificed for the sake of the sovereignty and this result, this problem, the problem between the sovereignty and the rights of the individuals, this debate led to the emergence of the concept of responsibility to protect R2P, it is also known as R2P. But this responsibility to protect cannot be applied in an uncomprehending way because the ground on which external intervention is done must be legitimized because if sovereignty is breached on frivolous grounds by the international organization, it may set dangerous precedent by which powerful states would increase their intervention into the weaker states in the name of protection of human rights of individuals. And unlike the case of refugees, as I already told you that there is no international universal treaty which the IDPs. In 1998, representative of the United Nations Secretary General on IDPs, M. Francis Deng proposed the guiding principles on internal displacement. And these guiding principles proved to be a milestone in the process of the protection of IDPs. The guiding principles consist of 30 standard principles that are there for the protection of IDPs and these 30 principles detail the rights and guarantees the protection of the IDPs from forced displacement. Their protection and assistance during displacement and for providing durable solution. But the problem is that they are not legally binding instrument. So, the principles, these guiding principles on internal displacement gained considerable authority since 1998. The UN General Assembly has also recognized it as an important international framework for IDP protection and encouraged all the relevant actors to align with the guiding principles for the protection of international internal displaced persons. Regional organization and states have also deemed the principles as a useful tool. So, we can say that migration in all its form is among the most pressing topics in the international agenda today. And so, the national and international responses must be guided by the needs of the migrants in terms of 
assistance and protection. So, it is essential to have an appreciation for the complicated origins of migration. And what are those origins? Poverty, injustice, exclusion, armed conflict, violence and so on and so forth. When we talk about refugees, there is refugee convention. But when we talk about IDPs, I have told that in 1998, guiding principles on internal displacement is there for the protection of IDPs. But as I said that they are not legally binding. So, government is not obliged to act as per the guiding principles. They are like the moral principles that should be adopted, that can be adopted, but they are not binding in nature. So, whether it is refugees, whether it is IDPs, migration in every form is one of the most pressing challenge and there is a need to look into the causes of this because in the face of this reality no country on their own can propose durable solution and can have effective measures. It is a critical problem. So, the national and international law that is there for the protection of the rights of the individuals, they apply to the rights of the migrants too. So, migration is a critical public problem that requires coordinated and ambitious solution at local, regional and global levels. Because migration is caused at local level. So, the first step that is needed is at the local level, then at regional level and the last is the global level. So, the primary responsibility is of the state and then of course, international organization is there which, which is basically there to protect the rights of all the individuals whether it is migrants or other citizens. They all should be treated as, as par by the international community but firstly by the national government. Thank you.